Amen. Be finding in your Bibles, if you would, take God's precious word and turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Children's Church can be dismissed and go with Steve. I would have dismissed you earlier, but I thought they might want to sit in with the baby dedications. So I was going to preach something else. I actually had an entirely different message prepared altogether. And then with the dedications this morning, I thought it'd be appropriate to kind of stick on the family theme. And so I want to kind of keep a, a more family-focused message today. And this is going to be primarily a message to parents, but is very much uh, applicable to young people as well. So please pay attention and, and listen. But Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 is going to be our text verse for this morning. This is perhaps the most well-known verse um, in the whole book of Proverbs. And I, I hear this quoted often. I see it um, posted online. I see different plaques and stuff with this verse on it. And I'm beginning to think it may also be perhaps one of the more misunderstood verses in the Bible. And I'd like to share with you uh, why this morning. So Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Would you stand, please, uh, just as we read this and give honor and reverence to God's word? It reads this. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon your word, the message today. Holy Spirit, may you just speak to us and soften our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. A while ago, I was uh, studying this verse and, and reading it because I've had it, I've had it quoted to me often and mentioned to me several times recently. And so I began to study this verse out, and uh, in my studying, I started to think that I don't think this verse means what we typically take it to mean. You know, typically people take this as a promise. And the idea is that if you raise your children right, if you raise them in a godly home, if you teach them the ways of Christianity, that when they get older, they will never fall away from Christianity, they will never fall away from the faith. And I, as I was studying this, I began to realize, I don't think that's what this is saying. And so these thoughts were kind of going through my mind, and very, very randomly, I happened to come across this podcast from another pastor who is a Hebrew expert, and he was talking about the Hebrew words of this verse and how it, it doesn't mean what we think it means. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, because he was talking about the very things that I was thinking about and then I happened just a couple weeks later to come across another podcast that I typically listen to, and she had a guest speaker on that day who was talking about the book of Proverbs. And as she was going through Proverbs, she came to this verse, and I started paying attention and listening, and, and sure enough, she's like, this is perhaps one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. And she went through the reasons why. And so I just thought, well, it was a really strong confirmation uh, to me because I'll be honest, I've taken this verse as a promise myself, that if you raise your children right, if you raise them in a godly home, that as they grow older, they'll never fall away from the faith. Or on the flip side, I've heard other people say, well, I raised my children, but now they're not living for the Lord. And so I'm claiming this verse as a promise that they're going to return to God and that they're, they're going to return to Christianity at some point in the future. And I've realized that this verse is not more so a promise, but more so a warning to parents. And so this is a really different type of message for me. I'm, I'm used to more kind of going through an expository type, one, two, three, four. But instead, we're going we're gonna to kind of look at this verse, and I want to break it down kind of word by word and, and look at this kind of really in-depth this morning, so kind of an in-depth Bible study for you this morning. And then I'd like to close by sharing uh, five things with you on how you can disciple your children um, to, the, to the best of your ability. Not too long ago, I had this very conversation with a family that I know, I know well, 
and they are a very strongly committed Christian family, solidly rooted in God's word as the authoritative word of God. And yet, about a year ago, their teenage daughter ran away from home and is no longer living the Christian life. And the parents came to me and they said, what did we do wrong? We, we raised her in the way that she should go. So why did she depart? And, and I know that they're claiming this verse as a promise that at some point, because they did their job in raising her right, that at some point she's going to return to the Christian faith. And I deeply hope that's the case, and I really, really pray for her that she does. Um, but I think that a lot of people have this kind of idea of this verse as a promise like that. And I want to take this examination of this verse word by word. So first of all, let's begin with the word train. Train up a child in the way he should go. And this is the Hebrew word hanak, and this is where we get the, the name Hanukkah. If you know anything about Hanukkah, it's the celebration of the dedication of the temple, right? The word hanak literally means dedicate. And that's kind of why I came across this as I was preparing for the dedication. I was kind of doing a, a word search on the di different words of dedicate, dedication in the Bible, and this one came up. So the word hanak means to dedicate, and it's used five times in the Old Testament, and four of the times it's talking specifically about dedicating a building. For some reason, here in Proverbs, it's translated train. But really, it's telling us to dedicate your child to the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, dedicating is different than training, right? To dedicate something is to yield something, is to give something up, to devote to. Just now, we witnessed as these parents dedicated their children to the Lord. They're giving their, their children to God. A couple weeks ago, uh, we were running really behind schedule. We just got some of our kids dedicated. And so we were telling Ethan, because he was going to be dedicated, he goes, what does that mean? I said, we're giving you away. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, we're, we're giving you to the Lord, but don't worry, he'll give you back. <laughs> but that's what dedication is. You, you are giving something up. You're you're giving them over to something else. So dedicating is different than training. When you dedicate yourself to the gospel, you're giving up your life for the gospel. We take up our cross because we're laying our life down daily for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So dedication is devotion, and it's yielding. It's giving away, giving up to the way they should go. And next is the word child. So train up a child. And this is the Hebrew word na'ar, which interestingly does not mean little child, little kids. I thought this was really interesting. So, okay, we're, not, we're no longer talking about little kids because I've always had this, this picture. It's talking about training your little children. It's talking about starting them off right, right? You get them their picture Bibles, you get them in Sunday school, you get them in the VBSs, you get them in all the, all the right Christian programs for little kids, then as they grow, they'll never wander, they'll never depart from the faith. It's not what this verse is saying. It's talking about adolescence. And actually, many times, this word is translated young man, young men. Now, I don't, I don't want to say that we don't ever train our children because there are, there are times when we have to train our children. Training is for, for little kids, for, for the really little children. But as they grow older and as they mature, as they grow older into youth, we focus less on training and more on discipling. It's no longer teaching them what to do but rather modeling why we do this and how we be a good Christian, how we be, uh, how we are a Christ follower. So at some point, training our children changes from 
training into modeling what a Christ follower looks like. So we see that this verse is telling us to dedicate, give up your child, give your child, your, your young person over to the way that he should go. And that brings us to the next part of this verse, in the way. So train up, dedicate your young person, your youth, in the way. And this is a, from the Hebrew word direct, and it comes from another root word. It's actually really cool. It's a carpenter's term. I, I like to notice stuff like that in the Bible. Being a carpenter myself, ooh, he's talking about carpentry. And this specifically is talking about when an archer is forming a piece of wood to make a bow. It refers to the natural bend and the natural grain in a piece of wood. So an archer is, who is looking to make the perfect bow knows how to look at the grain, and he knows how to look at the natural bent of that piece of wood and use that to the advantage of making a bow. This sent me off on a rabbit trail. I was on YouTube for hours <laughs> watching all these videos on how to make a bow out of a piece of wood. And it was really interesting. It was, it was cool. Uh, and th this one video, the guy was talking about how important this is. If you don't pay attention to the grain, the first time you use your bow, you'll, you'll snap it. It will break. It will shatter because you're not working with the bent, with the natural bent, with the grain of this bow. And this is the part where this verse is actually more of a warning. Really what it's doing is it's warning parents to give your child over, give your youth, not little child, give your youth over to the natural bent that God has given him or else destruction happens or else you will break them. You see, God has made each person unique. And much like unique pieces of wood, everybody's grain is different. And everybody's bent is different. God has given everybody different interests, different passions, uh, different desires. And so the warning here is to parents to take great care that you... Uh, that you use your youth's interests in a way that they can serve the Lord through them and not try to mold them and shape them into something that you want them to be. See, the idea has been for so long that I train up my child in the way that he should go. And when they start to reach that young adult age, we still have that instinct that I'm training them I'm molding them. I'm shaping them into what I think they should be. And too often we approach it, I think, with a hammer and a chisel when we should be working with the bent that God has given them. See, God has put that in them because he needs them to serve him in a capacity that only they can do. And we need... Christian people serving God in so many different ways. You know, and, and it goes beyond needing pastors and missionaries and evangelists. Yes, we need that. But you know what? We also need Christian doctors. We also need Christian mechanics. We need Christian pilots. We need Christian dance instructors. We need people serving God in every aspect of life. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's pretty cool. The, the 1599 Geneva Bible actually puts this point really well in this translation. It says this, Teach a child in the trade of his way, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that really sums that up well. Teach him in the trade of his way. So as parents, let me encourage you to notice what is your young person, young teenager, what are they passionate about? What, is, what are they, what gets them on fire? What are they excited about? And could it be that God wants 
to use those desires, those passions to serve him and bring glory and honor to him. Now, of course, I am in no way saying, and please don't take this out of context today, and say that if your young person's desires or passions are wrong, are unbiblical, that you're supposed to go along with it. I am not saying that in any way this morning. If your young boy suddenly tells you he wants to transition, I am not saying that you just go along with that as parents. That's a different, that's a different story. That's a moral sin that goes against God's word. But I'm talking about natural tendencies, natural abilities that God has given them so that they can serve him in a capacity that they can use as a platform to serve God. Now we have to mention the next word, and that's the word he. Train up a child in the way he should go. I've already actually kind of covered that pretty well because many of us get the idea that I decide the way that he should go. As the parent, I decide what he's going to be. And that's really where the problem is because if we're trying to direct their life in the way that we want it to go, we stand in danger of working against the grain and bending them the wrong way. And the danger is that we can actually bring great harm to our children by bending them in a way that God never intended for them to be bent. And sadly, that often results in a young person rebelling against God and walking away from church, walking away from the Christian faith. And then sadly, many parents flip this around and then they take this very verse that's trying to warn parents, don't do this. Then they try to flip it around and say, God, I'm claiming this promise. I raised up my child in the way he should go, but now, uh, now they're not. And so I need you to bring them back to me. And I'm claiming this promise. The, th the fact of the matter is, we don't decide which way they should go. God does. The Lord does. And at some point, listen to me, young people, at some point, your parents are no longer going to be directing your life. And at some point, you are going to be responsible for making those very own, your very own decisions on your own. See, as, as parents, we cannot decide in what capacity our children are going to serve the Lord. As parents, we cannot force them to take the job that we want them to have. We can't uh, force them to marry who we want them to marry. We can't force them to be in this or that ministry as much as we might like to, and it maybe would be a lot easier. That is not up to us. That's literally between them and the Lord. Our job as parents is to teach them how to listen to the voice of the shepherd and then let them follow him. As God leads them, they're going to be on the right path. Our job is to teach them to follow Christ because as they're following Christ, They'll never depart from that. And if, if we learn to work with their bent and they get to do something that they love and serve God at the same time through that, that is the promise that that is something they will never depart from. Because if they get to do what they love and serve God at the same time, they're going to live a lifetime doing what they love and serving God through that. So the full statement here is devote your young person to his God-given desires so that he can serve God with his full potential. And the promise is that if, if he does that, that is something he will never depart from for the rest of his life. All right, so real quickly, how can we disciple our youth. I want to share just five things with you very briefly, give you five pointers on how to disciple our youth. And they all start with L to make it easier for you. Number one, love them. You say, well, that seems so simple. I know. It is simple to say, but it's not always so simple to do or so simple to demonstrate. And you know, there are so many kids today that just don't know what it is to be loved. They're raised in homes and families. They're never shown any type of affection or any type of love. 
love your children. There's great, great books on that, the five love languages, learning how to show affection to your children. Some of them like the physical touch, the physical closeness. Some of them like receiving gifts. And it can be just something you hand make. It doesn't have to be anything special. It means the world to them. Some of them just want your, your time with them. Someone once said, you don't spell love, M-O-N-E-Y. You spell love, T-I-M-E, time. And I can pretty much guarantee you that no matter what age your child is, they probably want your time more than anything. There's something just special and precious about spending time together as a family. Number two, listen. Listen to them. This is a very important thing that we as parents need to learn to do. I'm still working very hard on this because this means giving them your undivided attention. It means putting this down. It means shutting off the computer, turning the TV off. Give them your undivided attention and listen to them. Another tip, match their emotions. When they're telling you something and they're excited, you get excited with them. Match their emotions. That, that connects with them. It shows not only am I listening to you, I'm understanding. And, and you're affecting my emotions. So get emotional with their story. When they're sad, be sad with them. Do your best to match their emotions that you're not only listening to them, but you hear them. And when it's possible, I, I know it's not always, but when it's possible, take their suggestions, use their suggestions. If you're deciding a place to go eat and one of your kids throws out a suggestion, you might not be particularly happy with that choice. But you know what? If you take their suggestion, you know what that communicates to them? Your input is valuable to me. Your voice matters to me, and I hear you. And that speaks volumes to them, that you respect their decision-making. Number three, lift them. Lift them. And by lift, I mean encourage. Kids today need a lot of encouragement. There's so much negativity in the world. The Bible warns us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, not to prov provoke our children to anger. And that is, don't put them down, but rather lift them up. And, you know, a lot of times we get this idea that, well, I praise my children. I give them praise. And can I warn you that praising your child might not be the same thing as encouraging your child. I just want to warn you about that because I, I hear things, and I, and I catch myself doing this. I praise my children, so I, I think I'm encouraging them. And you might say things like, oh, great job cleaning your room. Your room looks, your room looks wonderful. Or great job mowing the yard. You, you did a great job on the grass. It looks, it looks beautiful up to my standards. Or great job on your report card. You got straight A's. And you praise your child for these things, but do you know what the problem with this is? Let me warn you, you could be discouraging them instead of encouraging them because what it says to the child, you're praising, you are praising their performance. And what it says to them is that my appreciation of you is based on your performance of how you serve me. If you get your room clean, if you get the yard looking just right, if you get straight A's, then you'll have my acceptance. And then I'll be proud of you. But that's not encouragement. And encouragement says, you are my child, and I love you, and I appreciate you. I love your character qualities. Encouragement says, you know what? You didn't get straight A's on your report card, but that doesn't matter because I saw the effort and I saw the work that you put into it. You are diligent. You're a hard worker. And, and you, you never quit. You never give up. That is encouragement. So do your best to lift them, to let them know that you're proud of them, no matter what, even through their failures, especially through their failures, that you are proud of them. Number four, 
limit, limit them. This one is very important. Well, they're all important. But listen to me. If you love your kids, you, ha- you have got to limit them. If you don't set limits, you know what it apl- implies to a child? It implies rejection. It's to a child that says, you don't really care about me because you don't care enough to set limits on me that if I go beyond could harm me. I mean, even, even God put limits on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? They were free to do whatever they want, but there was one limit. Don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. And as parents, it's our job to provide everything that our children need, but we, are, we also have to set limits. If you care about them, you need to. You need to set boundaries. And you can be sure your children are going to push those boundaries. They're going to test those limits. And you know what happens if you give in and you don't hold that boundary and you give way to what the child wants? Then that child has no security whatsoever. And this teaches a child that there's no consequences. And I believe this is what is a major problem in America today is people are living their life as if there's no consequences because they've never had any. They've never had limitations from their parents. They've never had boundaries. And all of a sudden, here's these grown adult people breaking the law because there's no consequences. And they're in for a hard lesson. So if you... If you love your children, you're going to care enough about them to teach them that you live in a world that has consequences. And so that's why there's limits and there's boundaries. Now, your children might come to you and they might say, well, why can't we do this? Or why can't we do that? You know, other people are doing, other people at church do it. Such and such family does this. Why can't we? Let me give you a response that you can tell your children, right? Write this down. When your children come to you and they say, why can't we do this because other people do, you tell them this. When those people start raising children as fine as mine, then I'll start doing what they're doing. (laughs) That ends it. (laughs) Then number five, the last point, lead them. Lead them. All the rest of this isn't going to make much sense if you don't lead by example. So don't, don't try to mold them and shape them into the perfect Christians. That's just surface. But instead, you demonstrate what a disciple of Jesus looks like. Be real with your children. Don't try to convince them that as the parent that you never do wrong. Don't try to convince them that you're perfect. Let let me tell you this, your kids already know you're not perfect. (laughs) So don't try to pretend to them that you are. Be real with them. Don't be hypocritical. Don't be someone here at church and then be somebody totally different the rest of the week. Because they they notice that, they pick up on that. Confess your faults to them when it's appropriate. Confess your faults to your children. Ask them for, for forgiveness when you do wrong to them. Uh, I have one of my daughters, I, I won't share names, but one of my daughters, I had, uh, I had a, a nickname for her, a, a pet name. I thought it was cute. And it turned out that she did not like being called this nickname. And I didn't know this. So I, I, I used this nickname quite often, because I thought it was endearing and I thought it was cute. And this daughter, I noticed, distanced from me quite a bit. She'd she'd be the one that always would come up and sit on my lap and snuggle with me. She wasn't doing that so much anymore. And then one day I called her this nickname and she went off to her room. And I was like, what is, what's going on with that? And the rest of the family let me know she doesn't like it when you, when you call her that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> my heart broke. So I, I went into her room, and I sat down, and I said, honey, uh, daddy's really sorry. I, I didn't know that you didn't like this name. 
I was not trying to be mean or, or anything. I, I just thought it was cute. But here's the thing. It was wrong of me to use that name if you don't like it. And I promise you, I won't use it again. And you know instantly. I mean, it was like a, a switch got flipped. And her whole demeanor towards me changed. And we sat there talking in her room. And she was telling me all these stories and talking my ear off. And ever since then, she still will be the first one to come sit on my lap and, and snuggle me and be close with me. So forgive, asking for forgiveness, that humility, goes a long way. Let them see the affection between you and your spouse. Let them see you in God's word and on your knees in earnest prayer. Lead them in family times of devotion and prayer. Don't retaliate against someone else. If someone harms you or your family, teach them how it, what it means to love your enemies and to not harbor bitterness and angerness or get even. Simply put, you follow Jesus. You do your best to live like Jesus. And as you're following the shepherd and your children follow you, they're, they're going to follow Jesus themselves. That's how you lead by example. When your children see that dad doesn't just talk, he doesn't just talk the talk, but he lives it out by example, they will be far more likely to follow. You can have your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning. To go back to what we were saying about the verse in Proverbs, I'm not saying that if there's a wayward child that there's no hope because there, there sure is. Nobody can ever be far enough away from the arms of God or from the love of God. So if you're, if you're dealing with that, someone that you care about that is not living for the Lord, don't give up. I, ju I just encourage you, don't give up. You keep praying, you keep interceding. Because God cares about those lost sheep too. And as the good shepherd, he goes and he chases us down. And I'm thankful for that. But Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that for families that are experiencing uh, difficulties, whether it be children or brothers, sisters, even parents, whoever, that once knew the faith that have walked away, Lord, we just lift them up to you. I pray, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit after them like a hound dog that would chase them down, that they would not be able to outrun the love of our God. And Lord, I just pray that Really what they need is they need the truth of the gospel brought back into their life. It's not about religion. It's not about appearing as a perfect Christian, but it is about a relationship with Jesus Christ because our eternal souls are, are what matters. So Lord, I pray for broken, hurting families and Lord, that you would draw these wayward ones back to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us as parents Help us, Lord. Give us the wisdom and discernment to recognize the bent of our children and that we would learn to work with the grain. Lord, that we would not put our will above yours in their life, but that we would dedicate them. We would give them over to the plan and the purpose that you have put on their lives. May we raise a generation, Lord, that would change this world for Jesus. And Lord, help us as parents, as individuals, help us to just do our best as disciples of Jesus to follow you each and every day. Help us to remember that our life is a living, walking testimony and everything that we do is on display for our children and our family to see. So help us, Lord, as we follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name.
Amen.